Hey guys, Nigel here from SAC School. Welcome to our SAC School Live number eight. Number eight, it's our first um, episode in our second season. I'm really happy to have you guys here sharing it with us today. I'll tell you what we're gonna get up to today. Um, I'm gonna share with you my favorite saxophone tone building exercise. So this is a great little exercise for getting your intonation and your, um, your tone and all of your embouchure warmed up and really on point, which is great if you've had a break from saxophone for a little while or you're coming back to saxophone. So I'm gonna talk about that. I'm also gonna share some other tips and tactics and answer some questions from you guys. Um, I've got some questions already, but I'm looking forward to getting some more questions too. But most importantly, we're just gonna hang out, have a chat for the next 30 minutes or so and have a bit of fun. So um, if you're here, great. And uh, I hope you'll stay with us and have some fun with us. And don't forget to jump in the chat and say hi too. Um, so I've got the team with me here today. Chris and Claire are here. How are you guys doing? We're good, thank you. Yeah, Hi, Nigel. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. So lots of stuff to talk about today. Um, oh, before we get started, I should probably tell you who I am if we've not met before. So my name's Nigel. I run this thing called Sax School, which is a really cool place to learn saxophone online. Basically, as a member of Sax School, you get uh, access to a whole huge library of saxophone lessons. There's over 600 lessons in there now, and they're organized into um, categories and mini courses, so you can really find what it is that you want to learn. That's the cool thing about sax school. You can follow your own path, learn at your own pace, and the lessons are all really easy to follow with, you know, you can see my fingers, there's music and there's backing tracks, and there's all sorts of stuff like that. But the best part about it, actually, is we've got a really active community of um, learners socially with SAC School. So we've got, as a member, you get access to our private Facebook group and we've got what, about 1,200 people or 1,300 people in there yeah, now who are SAC School. Yeah, it's growing all the time as well, every single day. It's going yeah, to be it's, a lot of people. it's crazy. There. So like 1,300 of our members are in this Facebook group and it is an incredible place to be because every day people are sharing stories, asking questions, getting help. Um, talking about their successes, and also meeting other saxophone players, which is, I think it's brilliant. So you're not learning by yourself, you're part of this huge community. Anyway, that's what Sax School's all about. Um, oh, tell you what, before we get started, uh, we should do a quiz, because we normally do a quiz. And I was racking my brains about what to talk about today, and Claire, Claire helped me with this. Chris has got no idea, because he's far too young. <laughs> but, <laughs> if you ever watch The Muppets, here's the question. Who knows, let me know, if you know this, then make sure you put it in the chat. Who was the saxophone player that recorded a lot of the parts for Zoot from the Muppets? Now, there was a Barry player and there was a tenor player, but I'm talking about the tenor player here. The tenor player, the session guy who recorded the parts for Zoot. So, if you know that, pop it in the chat and we'll have a chat about that at the end of this session today. And, uh, and if you, you know, I'll get Chris to keep an eye on that, so if you, uh, if you get the right answer, we'll let you know too. Awesome. Rightio, so let's get started. Now before um, I get into showing you my favorite saxophone warm-up tone builder exercise, I thought I should tell you a bit about what I've been up to the last little while. Because um, the last session we did like this was in July. Was it July? Yeah, it was yeah. 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 July. Yeah. So it's been a few weeks. Uh, I've been off on holidays with the kids and uh, the whole family. We've been off for the summer holidays, uh, traveling around, having lots of fun doing different things in Europe, which has been awesome. But that of course means getting back, I've got to get back into my playing. So the last couple of weeks since I've been back, I've been working hard on my practice, uh, looking at um, all sorts of things to build my tone up, which is why I wanted to talk to you about this, um, this exercise today. Um, hey, if you've had a break over the summer, or if you're just getting back into your saxophone after a break, then let us know in the chat too, because I'm sure there's gonna be a, a few of you in the same situation as me. So I've been busy doing that. I've also been busy creating some new exciting lessons for sax school. We had a masterclass last week and had some great, probably some of you guys are on the session today. It was really great fun. I love doing those. Um, but I've been working away. Chris has been helping me on a new course called uh, Introduction to Classical Saxophone. Now, even if you don't like classical saxophone, the point of that mini course, which is going to be available inside sax school in a couple of weeks time, is about using the classical music as a way to develop your intonation and your technique and your musicality. It's a really, really powerful approach, I think. So that's a lot of fun. And the other thing I've been doing, it's been pretty busy, is I can't say too much about this yet, but I will be uh, taking in a new bunch of students for the Blues Mastery course in a few weeks' time. So it's kind of a little preview thing. Um, 
can't say too much yet and I'll be putting more things out about this in the coming couple of weeks but Blues Mastery is an awesome uh, course if you're looking to up, le up level your skills at improvising really um, understand the blues which I think is a gateway to all improvising so it's a fantastic course I'm just going to take a few students in and run them through the course over a period of a few weeks so that's what I've been doing so um, what about you guys what about um, what about you Chris what are you up to I've been uh, out doing a few gigs over the weekend we've had um, had one down in St Albans so I was doing a depth gig for a wedding which was very good, okay. very interesting. I had to learn a lot of music in the space, a very short space of time, but it was good fun. So that's real bread and butter stuff doing depth gigs, you know, particularly as a young musician. So how do you find that process? Because, uh, I mean, you know, you're a great player, but when you go into a new situation with a new band, you you've got lots of stuff to learn, right? You do, yeah. You've got to you've got to really click with people um, pretty quickly and. Usually, I mean, it's useful to have, as we did, we had a, a musical director who was sort of leading us all, you know, pointing out solos or going through different sections and stuff. And we did have iPads with sheet music, which was super useful. But you've got, you just got to do as much practice as you can, learn the charts before you go in, and um, hope. <laughs> do your home. No, I hope. I don't like that homework. No, you see, but don't do, you got to do your homework. That's the secret, isn't it? Yeah. I think homework, listening, uh, it's the same even if, um, you know, if there's guys on the call here who have never played a live gig before, or maybe thinking about doing their first one, it's the same principle. You know, if you're going maybe to do a jam session or you go play in a community band, it's the same thing, isn't it, Chris? You it know? is, yeah. Yeah, listening to other players, you know, being aware of what's going on and preparing, doing your homework. Yeah, lots so, of preparation, yeah. lots of practice. We've yeah. also had some, um, I'm sure Claire will talk a little bit about this, but we've had um, some people working on the duets. We had Janet and John who have been uh, putting together a backing track for Lazy Sunday Blues. They've uh, gone and utilised the uh, the Lazy Sunday Blues track, which is a duet Nigel's put together in sax school. And uh, they're actually using a program called Band in a Box, which is some software that you can you can purchase. Yeah, putting together a backing track, and uh, awesome. hopefully we'll get to see that soon. Awesome, eh? That'd be great. Maybe you, um, see that's part of the community side of sax school, I suppose. Mm. It'd be great to see how they get on with that. I saw the video where they just recorded themselves playing it. Mm. So, yeah, maybe that's something that they can share with the other people in sax school too. Yeah, yeah, very awesome. What about you, Claire? What's been going on in the Facebook group? Oh, it's been really busy as usual. Um, Unlike you, Nigel, I think people haven't been taking a big break over the summer. They have still been playing lots and lots. Um, oh, should I be feeling guilty? Yeah. No, is, that, is that cute no. for me? Because <laughs> um, I really like being on holiday. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, the duet, yeah, the duets course has been brilliant. A duets mini course, lots of people have been uh, posting about that, really, really enjoying it. Um, so that's been brilliant. Lots of people sharing the videos of, of them doing duets. Sometimes uh, if they've got somebody they can play with, somebody actually playing with a duet, sometimes play with Nigel. So, you know, Nigel taking one part, them taking another. So that's, that's yeah, great. Cool. Lovely opportunity. And people talking about um, how much they're learning from that experience. So that's really good. You know, that duets course has been really popular inside Sax School. I'm, I, it's, it's funny because uh, I guess it seems obvious now, but, um, you know, I didn't. it took a long time for me to get around to doing that course. And a lot of people have been asking about it for a long time. And then, you know, since we did it, it's only a few weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. People yeah. love it. Yeah, it's really great. Um, the masterclass went down really well as well earlier in the week. Uh, had some great feedback from that. Uh, Nick posted a video where he'd been putting into practice uh, some of your tips on phrasing and breathing. Uh, and a lot of people were giving him some great feedback about, you know, how, how much uh, they could hear an improvement in his playing. So that's, uh, that's nice to see yeah. that people are really sort of taking that and that learning and, and going with it straight away. That's really awesome. Great. Actually, you know, I saw that video too. And uh, I guess that's one of the things I love about the community side of SAC school because, you know, so Nick is learning by himself. He lives in Norway um, and he's played for our masterclasses a couple of times. Every month we do a masterclass where we people can actually play for us in front of the whole group. It's probably terrifying. And uh, and then well, we worked on some stuff. And uh, But he, he's in Norway, so... He does play with a community band and stuff, but he's, you know, a long way from uh, everyone else at sax school. But how awesome is it that he can play something, record it, and then get some feedback from all those other people in the community? It's really, really great. Yeah? Yeah, fantastic. Cool. Really lovely. Wow. So there's tons of stuff going on, basically. Um, yeah, awesome. Cool. So if you've got something, uh, if you've got a question that you'd like some help with today, don't forget to jump in the chat. And, um, and let us know, and hopefully we'll get through as many of your questions as we can. Rightio, so, I thought we'd have a talk about my, see I've got this big list here, which is getting harder and harder for me to see. Two things happened when I was on holiday. Number one is my beard grew, and number two, my eyesight is getting worse and worse. What's this? Look, 
Yeah. I can't wear my glasses now. Maybe they're too eclectic, Nigel, but the beard is in his You think? Side. Does that mean if I shave my beard yeah. off, my eyesight will get well, better? Well, we do that. We wait for the Oh, my hair's falling out, my beard's growing, and my eyesight's going, they're going to pot. It's not going well. Right, yeah, okay. So I want to tell you about this, um, this Tone Builder warm-up tip. Now, I actually made a little worksheet for this, and I'll tell you where you can get this in a few minutes. This is a really simple little exercise. Uh, I'm a fan of finding new and different ways to practice um, technique, um, you know, scales, stuff that I can incorporate into my practice that really helps me to develop my skills quickly. You know, I've been practicing for a long time, 30 years, I'm still practicing all the time, and I still have to maintain my skills. So I need to maintain my intonation, my tone, uh, my embouchure strength. So I'm always working on things that are gonna help me with that. So, you know, I've had a couple of weeks off, and so now I need to do more of that sort of practice to get myself back up to where I'm comfortable with it being. And scales are great, major scales, minor scales, blue scales, pentatonics, they're all great, but they can get a bit boring. So. I like to spice things up a little bit. And today I was just gonna really quickly show you um, an exercise that I like to do that makes scales a little bit more fun. Now, there's tons of other scale and warm-up type exercises inside SAC School. Um, and in fact, I've got some free resources I'll tell you about in a second that'll be great if, if you want to find out more about that sort of stuff too. So one of the things I like to do with scales that, that is um, really beneficial for me, I find it, it helps me to to improve and uh, work out my embouchure really, really well, so I improve much faster, is to practice my scales slowly, but to do them in intervals. So I've talked about this before, but my favorite interval is using a fifth. So what I'm talking about here is playing the first note of a scale, and then I play the fifth note of a scale, and then the second note of the scale, and then the sixth note of the scale, third, seventh, fourth, octave, that kind of thing. Now. I'm doing that sort of exercise slowly, but I'm also using a tuner just so I can check my intonation and make sure that I'm actually uh, on point. Um, going slowly means I've got more time to think about this as well. So that's the basic exercise. So let's say you could do it in any scale. Let's say we're using a G major scale. So G major scale's got an F sharp in it. Come back, I'll stand up so you guys can see my fingers. So it's got F sharps in it. <laughs> Okay, so a G major scale, that's pretty easy and it's not really challenging, but if we play it solely and we go first note and then fifth note, which would be the D, and then the second note, which is the A, and then the sixth note, which is the E, once you get in the swing of it, it's pretty easy actually. It's almost like playing two scales at the same time. It sounds like this. And you can keep going all the way to the top of your scale. And then back down again. Okay, so that's the basic exercise. Now, it sounds pretty simple. However, if you're using that with a tuner, it's surprising how, how challenging it can be. Claire's shaking her head, she's saying, don't ever do that to me. <laughs> right, now, uh, something else I want to tell you. I did mention this on the, um, on the Masterclass. I've been playing around with a different tuner. I use Clear Tune a lot, which is a great app. But uh, there's this other tuner that I use called um, T, T E Tuner. It looks like this. I'll tell you, I'll show, <laughs> I'll show you why I like this tuner, right? It does two things. So it's a tuner app, it's going crazy at the moment, I don't know what's going on. It's a tuner app that also does a metronome. So it's a metronome and a tuner. Have you seen this, Chris? Uh, only on your live stream, but yes, I oh, have really? seen it, yeah. <laughs> That's actually really cool. I can't even remember how much it costs. It might even be free, I don't know. And I don't even know if it's for Android. I'm rubbish at giving you information, really. But TE Tuner, you definitely want to check this out. Because it's cool that you can have a met. Oops, it does something else as well. You can have a metronome as well as having a tuner in the same box. Now, that's really important because let's say that I'm practicing this exercise and I want to have my 
metronome going on my music stand. At the same time, I can have my tuner going, letting me know whether I'm in tune as I'm playing through. So for me, uh, that's an absolute bonus. And there's, there's another thing I like about this tuner. Let me just show you this. Okay, so the tuner, it tells you when you're in tune by giving you a big happy smiley face. <laughs> Smiley face gets bigger the more the longer you're in tune. How awesome is that? That's pretty good. Pretty that's, useful. Who doesn't love a smiley face to make sure <laughs> they're in tune? Okay, so that's a really simple exercise. Now you might be looking at that and thinking, that's not really going to help me. It's too easy. But trust me, if you have a go at doing that for five minutes each day on different scales, I guarantee you will see a big improvement with the quality of your uh, tone, your uh, accuracy of your intonation, and also the strength of your embouchure. Super, super uh, useful exercise. Sometimes the simple things are the best. So I've got a little worksheet for you just to remind you of what we spoke about um, today. And you can actually download this if you go to the blog page for this um, for this episode. So if you go to the, we'll put a link in it, why don't you guys put the link in here. Yeah? Um, we'll put a link to it on the um, so the Sax School and McGillMusic.com blog uh, for this episode, episode number eight. And uh, you just click the link and download it. There's, you don't have to put your email in or anything, just download it. And it's super simple, but you know, maybe you could take the challenge of doing that this week and seeing if it helps you out. I think it would. But I did also mention that there was some other things that you can do to um, some other resources. If you're not a Sax School, well, if you're a Sax School member, go into the members area and you can search for warm-ups in there, and there's a bunch of great warm-ups, um, lessons and bundles and all sorts of stuff. But if you're not a SAC School member, I've got another free thing which I definitely recommend you should check out, and that's my Ultimate Saxophone Toolkit. And no, it's not pliers and screwdrivers, it's actually lessons. And there's some really cool lessons in there, and one of my favorites that I've actually been using myself this week is my five-minute warm-up workout. And the cool thing about that, it's a bit like what we're talking about with intervals, but you actually play along with me with a backing track. Um, so you're listening to a band as you're working on your long tones and your breathing and your tonguing and your intonation. So it's a, like, you know, it's a real proper workout, super hard, but that's for free. So we'll put a link for that in the um, chat here today as well, or you can go to mcgillmusic.com and look for the links for the Ultimate Saxophone Toolkit. So there you go. So guys, we got any, any uh, is there anybody, any other comments, people? We had uh, Rob, Rob Stevens said, most gigs I do, I play solo with backing tracks. I don't often get to play with other musicians. Um, I was thinking that you could, um, you could try looking out for some sort of jam sessions in your area. Sometimes um, in, depends where you are. If you're in sort of quite a um, uh, yeah. rural area, it, it can be hard to find them. But if you're sort of closer to the, to the city, you might be able to find a few jam sessions to go along to. It's surprising how many things there are around, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of the sax school guys play in jam sessions. Or mm -hmm. the other thing is community bands, you know, playing in community bands where there's, um, where, you know, people get, uh, well, there's community bands, but there's also things like um, just getting together with mates and, and having a jam in your lounge room. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. So, okay, that's cool. Um, any other questions? We've had a, we've had a few people um, commenting that about uh, they thought that was a nice way of uh, making the scales a little bit more exciting to play and a bit more interesting, uh, and people talking about uh, using long tone exercises and things like that. Terry mentioned that he does it every day with his long tone exercises. Oh, that's brilliant. So, yeah. yeah, that's really great. Yeah, long tones are really, really good for you, but they can get a bit boring, so you've got to kind of spice them up a bit. Uh, and I think that's the magic sauce, because if you can keep things interesting, it makes you want to practice more. Okay, great. So... Um, let's crack on because we've got some questions that already came in and I wanted to get through these ones first and then don't forget if you've got any other questions or things you need help with or things you want to tell us about what you've been up to this last week then pop those in the chat too and we'll try and get through them. Now the first question that we had and I'm going to try and do this without my glasses. The first question, <laughs> I was like this. Yeah. Um, so actually I didn't write down who asked this question but we had some chat in amongst the community about um, using play along books. Now, I actually think play-along books are great. If you've never used a play-along book, a play-along book is a book of music that comes with a CD, kind of old-fashioned, actually, coming with a CD, I was thinking, don't you? Anyway, they come with backing tracks to play along with. 
and they there are tons of them on the market some are better than others but if you find some good ones then they're a great supplementary thing to use in your practice because it can make things you know a bit more fun you can learn some different sorts of music and it's not just jazz tunes you can get play along books that will for the music from frozen or tv themes or movie themes or classical music there's all sorts of stuff now like I was saying, there are some good ones and there's some bad ones. So you need to try different ones to see which work out. I got sent some recently. Uh, these are published by Advanced Music. And it's a series of books by Jim Snedero, who is a really great jazz educator in the States, actually. Um, and this is called The Essence of the Blues. Now, these are actually, I think these are great. I've had a play through some of these. They do an alto. Is that one for, that one's for tenor? They do one for alto. They've even sent me the clarinet one. So the clarinet one's pretty cool. And they got, what I like about these is that uh, Jim has written a bunch of songs in the style of famous jazz tunes. So this is a jazz focused, uh, jazz and blues focused uh, book series. But so he's taken a, a song that's, he's written a song that's like a famous song, like um, Blue Train, Miles Davis tune or something like that. And then he's got a, uh, a backing track and on the CD there's the band but there's also a version of the band with um, a famous player. He's got Eric Alexander playing on here which is really really cool. There's um, Ken Poplowski doing the clarinet stuff which is amazing. So yeah these are really really good. So if you see these online I definitely recommend those ones. Uh, so this is by Jim Snedero and it's published by Advanced Music. They've got some really good stuff on there. So things like that can be a great way to supplement your learning, whether you're learning with SAC School or learning with a, a teacher near you. Uh, I'd definitely recommend them. If you're using a play-along book, let us know in the chat because I'd love to know which ones you're using. And, and another set that have been around forever that are amazing are the Jamie Abersole play-alongs, and those are more improvisation-focused. But you can also use them just for if you're beginning out with improvising um, because there's a whole range of them, and some of them are... Uh, really at the elementary level. And so again, although you can do lots of learning in SAC school, things like buying those Jamie Abersole books are great because they can just give you an opportunity to um, use the skills that you've learned in a different context. So I definitely recommend those. Yeah? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Anybody else, uh, any other comments about play along books? Uh, not so far that I can speak with if you spotted any there. Not for play, play along books, no. We've had um, Mark Robertson ask uh, about He's basically asking about nerves when playing. He said uh, he plays sax in his music room. Uh, it doesn't do too bad, but when his friends come in or ask him to play something, uh, he makes loads of mistakes and feels silly. So any ideas for how to help with performance nerves? Yeah, that's a great question. Who was it from again? It was from Mark Robinson. Mark, yeah, it's a great question, Mark. Absolutely. And I think all of us struggle with, with that. And I have to tell you, I've played with some really big name people in front of uh, you know, tens of thousands of people and even really seasoned professionals, everyone gets nervous. Those guys get nervous. You think they'd never get nervous. They get nervous as well. It's more about managing, um, managing it and finding a way to work around it. So the first thing is definitely um, doing your homework. So understanding, you know, knowing the stuff that you're worrying about being able to play because that's going to give you a lot of confidence. And then apart from that, I think it's just about getting your head around the fact that, you know, I guess, I guess getting experience playing in front of friends and family is a good starting point. Um, but whether you're playing in front of friends and family or whether you're on stage in front of a whole bunch of random people you don't know, I think it's important to remember that everybody is watching you. They want you to do a good job. They don't want you to fail. And most of us in our heads are on stage or in front of our friends thinking, oh my God, uh, is this going to be awful and everyone's going to hate me. Everyone wants to enjoy listening to you play great. So you just got to relax into it and um, find the confidence in you to shut out all of that and just focus on your own playing. So it's definitely a mental game. There's plenty of books about this. There's plenty of um, things on YouTube that you can watch. But ultimately, it just comes down to that. It's about shutting out all of the, the, the negative thoughts, focusing on what you're good at, that you've done the hard work at, and getting involved with the passion of the music. I read a great quote, actually, and... Um, I'm going to butcher this, but it was basically saying, you know, you need to show people how much you love the music that you're playing. That's basically what it's about. So, which is a, a great way to flip things around. So instead of thinking, oh my God, what if I play a wrong note? Instead, think, you know, 
I really want to celebrate how much I love the music that I'm playing, and that's what I'm going to focus on, and really get involved in that. If you're enjoying it and you're loving it, everyone else is going to love it too. That and lots of practice. Yeah, uh, somebody's commented back actually, uh, good Paul, saying just, just keep doing it. And I think that's... that's uh, yeah, it's really, really good advice. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the more you do it, the easier it gets. You know, and even starting out, like we were talking before about... Um, you know, community bands or jam sessions um, or getting together with some mates in your garage. All those things are uh, opportunities or live streaming or making a video of yourself and putting it in the Facebook group. All those things are performances and the more you do them, the easier it gets. Awesome, right, so we had, um, we had another good question. Now this is a, okay, so I'll do this one first. So I had a question from Jose and Jose was saying, about synthetic reeds. He was saying uh, that he finds synthetic reeds don't seal very well as natural reeds when uh, trying to create a vacuum on his mouthpiece. And that, is that just my experience or is that part of the synthetic reed deal? Yeah, good question, Jose. I'll be honest with you, I've not really had a problem with uh, reeds sealing on my mouthpiece, but it's the seal on your mouthpiece is an important thing to be um, aware of when you're setting up your mouthpiece. So, okay, a couple of things. First of all, if you're consistently having a problem with reed sealing on your mouthpiece, it could be, I'm not saying that your mouthpiece is damaged, but it might be something that, you know, specific to your mouthpiece. I'd be curious to know, Jose, if your synthetic reeds seal on a different mouthpiece. In general, synthetic reeds are more stable, so they're more um, accurate in terms of the, uh, the back of them being flat because of the products, you know, the materials that they're made from. But if your reed isn't sealing on here, if it's a cane reed, often it's because the, the cane has been distorted. But if you're getting a consistent problem with reeds not sealing on your mouthpiece, it's more likely to be an issue with your mouthpiece. So the first thing I do is if you have another mouthpiece, just experiment and see if those uh, reeds do seal on the other mouthpiece. Um, for example, years back in Australia, I bought an Otto Link, or I wanted to get an Otto Link tenor saxophone mouthpiece. And this wasn't a cheap mouthpiece, a metal one, I can't remember what they were, $300 or something. But I literally went through 10 mouthpieces, new ones at the shop, before I found one that a reed would seal on. And it was, for some reason, there was a batch of them that they were all slightly faulty. And, uh, you know, it's not an uncommon thing. That's why when you go to try a mouthpiece in a shop, you generally want to try more than one. So it could be that. I'm not saying it is your mouthpiece, but that's what I'd check out. But for everybody else, the pop test is definitely a good thing to check out. Uh, make sure that your reed is sealing properly. If it's sealing on the mouthpiece, that means it's going to perform. So to put, you put your mouthpiece on to, together with your reed, you put your hand at the bottom, and then you just suck all the air out of the mouthpiece, and the reed will close onto the mouthpiece. So it's like this. Did you hear that pop? So the popping is the reed coming away from the mouthpiece. And if it, you know, if it holds for a little while and then pops off, perfect. That wasn't too bad. Where are you, Chris? Pretty good. Not too bad. Okay. If the reed was really soft, it would take longer to, to pop out. And if it doesn't seal at all, then you know you've got a problem with your reed or your mouthpiece. So you should all check that on your, on your saxophone. It's super important. We've kind of run out of time really quickly. How did that happen? Who knows that? <laughs> no, it's, that. It's, gone, it's gone quick. I had a bunch of other questions about improvising, but we're, we're kind of running out of time. Are there any other questions that people have been asking? There was a really good question, I think, uh, Claire spotted. It's about um, tenor, tenor, it was a question about tenor reeds. Oh yeah, um, somebody said, could you use uh, a tenor, oh, which one was it? Was could it you use a tenor reed on an alto in an emergency? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Could you do that? Mm, I don't know. Well, you could try it. I mean, a tenor reed's a lot bigger than, than, a, uh, than an alto, and I think you'll struggle to get it on the mouthpiece. Hey, if you're in that <laughs> if you're in that much of an emergency, then I wouldn't say don't try it. I've heard of people trying to use tenor reeds on bass clarinets and uh, alto reeds on clarinets and stuff. Uh, you know, it's not really designed for the job. You could try it and see. I wouldn't recommend it. I would instead say it might be better to have um, some spare reeds in your saxophone case. Top tip, <laughs> as I <I'd> suggest. <laughs> Uh, okay, so look, we had a bunch of other questions. Maybe we'll get on to them next week about improvising. Yeah. Um, but uh, before we finish off, we've got a couple things to do. First of all, I wanted to tell you what the quiz question was. So if you remember, 
we were asking who was the saxophone player who recorded the tenor parts for Zoot from the Muppets. Uh, before we do that, did we get anybody? We did. We got uh, so the first correct answer was from Joe Barker. So well oh, done to Joe, well and we also Joe. had Joe Preston. So both the Joes today. Joes, <laughs> you guys are smart. Tell you what. Well, for those of you who um, who may not have known, the answer is Frank Reedy. So Frank Reedy, session guy, played with Ted Heath, Benny Goodman. He recorded uh, clarinet parts on the Sgt. Pepper's Beatles thing. So he's one of those guys that's done lots and lots of stuff, and he is the guy who recorded the tenor parts. For Zoot, who knew? How about that? Legend. Yeah, legend. I wish I'd done that. How awesome was <laughs> that? That'd be cool. Yeah, well, yeah, you've never seen the Muppets, so you don't really know, do you? So. <laughs> Look at your T-shirt. Look at your T-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, next yeah. time. You can probably watch it on YouTube or something. Yeah, Netflix. Netflix. Definitely Netflix. hilarious on YouTube. Netflix. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, so that's the quiz. Now, um, the I would also definitely recommend you go and grab the Tone Builder thing from the blog. We'll put a link in the notes, or if you go to the, the Sax School blog, uh, you'll find it on there. And if you're really looking for something to boost um, your technique and tone, then grab that free saxophone toolkit because there really are some great stuff in there. There's a handful of my favorite things in there that will really, really help you. And um, you can get that also from the Sax School website. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for hanging out with us today. I hope you found that useful. And uh, you know, you could really help us actually by sharing this link on your Facebook feed too because we're going to be doing this next season over the next few weeks, each Monday at 8 p.m. And we'd love to have you come and join us for a chat. And you know, I love getting questions from you guys that we can, we can answer as well. So if you've got something you want to help with during the week, pop us over an email, saxschool at mcgillmusic.com or put something in our Facebook uh, page. Uh, don't forget to go check out Sax School. Help us out by sharing it on your Facebook feed too. But most importantly, have an awesome week. Practice hard. Goodbye from all of us. And we'll catch you all next week. Bye.